be reading 1 Corinthians 9, uh, verse 27, New King James, New King James. But I discipline my body and bring it into subject, subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Brother Andrew, I've heard of a congregation who sang the first verse of that song and then dismissed everyone. I think uh, that, that, that is truly uh, a mistake, uh, uh, because you're ending there with all of self and none of thee, and obviously you have to sing through those verses to get that song right, so um, so grateful for your song leading and so grateful for all those that serve, and uh, grateful to be with you all as we start off 2023, and looking here at a really a wrap-up of 2022, as we have been studying throughout the week this last week. Uh, leading up to today, the first day of the week, uh, with our uh, material, My Life in Him, and we were looking at self-control as we've been bringing our study of the fruit of the Spirit to a close, looking here at these, these traits and these characteristics that we find in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23. And as we discussed in our Bible class, it's, in, it's interesting when you start to really contemplate not only the fruit of the Spirit and these traits, you think about uh, aspects such as love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Uh, but you really could think about any aspect of the law of God, any trait of what it means to be a Christian, any uh, small particular area that we would limit our scope and study in, drill deeper down into, without self-control, without a willingness to deny and reject self and pick up the will of God and then apply those instructions to our lives, uh, we would not be helped. And so it's interesting that these traits and these characteristics end with self-control and that we're also ending our study uh, for 2022, although the new year beginning here, 2023, looking at self-control. And as you think about this, this topic, as you think about self-control, I want you to imagine one of those tightrope, uh, maybe on a, a television show or some type of stunt that's maybe occurring where a whole bunch of TV cameras get around or some type of a YouTube stunt, and this daredevil gets up there on maybe a cliff or some high up mountaintop or maybe even in between skyscrapers and buildings and has a tightrope from one end to another. And there's hundreds and hundreds of feet that go down, that if he were to fall, he would clearly die. And I want you to imagine that you were to attempt such an effort. First of all, if you're like me, you wouldn't get anywhere close to that. But imagine just the very thought of it for a moment. You would be fixated on whatever you're supposed to be fixated on to maintain your balance. You would be focused on putting one foot in front of another, you don't want to go too far to one side or the other. You don't want to lean too far to one side or the other. And you know any misstep and you're plunging to your death. So you're extremely focused. You're extremely careful. You're extremely controlled trying to get from one side to another. Well, I want you to think about what we find in the scripture regarding the way of life. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 7, beginning there in verse 13, he says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way, or confined is the way, which leads to life. And there are few who find it. In other words, there's a short, uh, or rather a, a small, a narrow way that we have to walk in order to have eternal life. And it is incumbent upon us to walk it. It's not optional. You think about likewise what the Proverbs writer writes in Proverbs chapter 4 and in verse 27. Do not turn to the right or the left. Remove your foot from evil. Verse 25, ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be 
established. Verse 25, let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. God has shown us throughout the scripture the need to be controlled, to be fixated on the path that we are supposed to walk, to not turn to the right or to the left. And so thinking about self-control, the application of the scriptures, abiding in the scriptures, the difficulty of doing it, and thinking about the essentiality of it in order to go to heaven, let's get down to the very basics. Whenever we get down to the basics, I like to get to the ABCs. Let's get to the ABCs of self-control. First of all, let's look at the areas of self-control. My sister Linda commented this morning in Bible class that self-control is relevant to all areas, all aspects of life. Absolutely. And one of the first aspects that we should ponder and consider, we're going to look more deeply together this afternoon in our afternoon sermon, is the inputs of life. In other words, what is it that we fill our mind with? What is it that we are engaged with that our heart is set upon? Because that is going to lead to how we live and the behavior that we engage in. Think about Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Likewise, Jesus in Matthew chapter 15, in describing those that were not abiding in the way that they should be abiding, not living the way they should be living, uh, points out where the defilement comes from. Notice there Matthew chapter 15 and verse 19. He says, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. You see, this idea of I'm not able to help the way that I behave... I'm not able to help the way that I feel. I'm not able to help the way that I react. We are able to help it. We are able to control it. Doesn't mean we're going to do it perfectly. Doesn't mean we're never going to stumble. But it is something that we are to aspire toward. God commands it. For those actions and those deeds, those lifestyles, conduct that is unrighteous, that is evil. Where does it come from? It initiates from the heart. As a man thinks, so is he. And so areas of self-control that we can pay attention to include our inputs. What is it that we're filling our mind with? What is it we're filling our heart with? What is it we're associating ourselves with? Who is it that we are associating ourselves with? What are our inputs? Areas of self-control include the category of our emotions and our feelings. I've heard someone say before in an argument regarding the topic of truth and what truth is, comment, commenting that feelings are truth. In other words, if I feel a certain way, it is true simply because I feel it and because I feel it, what I feel is therefore true. Well, yes, the feelings themselves may be true in that you are actually feeling those things, but that does not mean the context and what you're thinking relative to those feelings are also true. Our heart is capable of deceiving us. Our heart, our mind is capable of having us drift away outside of the way in which we should be walking. You think about what... The Proverbs writer writes in Proverbs 16 and in verse 32, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Uh, a young man especially is going to deal with the topic, with the category, with the area of anger as it relates to his emotions. And just because he feels angry, it does not mean he can just react and respond however he'd like. Be angry and sin not. And we see here the need as well as the difficulty of ruling the Spirit. You know, I am fascinated by great achievements, military achievements, achievements of a, of a political nature, as it relates to the causes of democracy, Causes of freedom. I like to get behind those kinds of things. 
I'm entertained by stories of victory in those kinds of areas. I support it from an ideological perspective. And as a man, a lot of times you identify with what's needed from a strength perspective, from an iron fist perspective in order to be victorious in those contexts. But the Bible says the fixation ought to be on the control of one's spirit. Not on the actual conquest of a city. Isn't that interesting? God's saying don't look outward. Don't try to be victorious from an outward perspective by conquering a city. No, instead look inwardly and control your emotions. Control your anger. For if you do that, if you are ruling your spirit... (laughs) You're better than he who takes a city. Notice likewise, Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 28. Proverbs 25 and verse 28. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a broken down, is like a city broken down without walls. Likewise, you are exposing yourself just like a city that were to be exposed without ruling your own Spirit. If you think also about what the Proverbs writer writes in Proverbs chapter 28 and in verse 26, he who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but whoever walks wisely will be delivered. You might say, well, you know what? I, I feel this way and the anger just allows me to live it out so easily. Surely that must be right. Surely the way that I feel allows these words to flow out so easily. This must be something that is acceptable. Proverbs writer writes, admonishes us not to trust in our own heart, not to trust in our own way of thinking, for doing so is foolish. Areas of self-control include inputs, emotions, feelings, but also include our very actions, the way in which we behave. Mike read just a few minutes ago in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and in verse 27, Paul is saying there that he's disciplining his body. He's bringing it into subjection lest when he has preached to others, he himself should become disqualified. In other words, he likewise has to be mindful of his own behaviors and actions. It's not just ideological. It's also practical. It's how he actually lives. Areas of self-control, inputs, emotions, feelings, actions. What about our evaluations? In other words, can we control the actual practice of evaluating the way in which we're behaving? Sometimes we are not very motivated to consider and grade and test the way that we are living. Usually this time of the year, people are willing to at least contemplate that to a certain degree. Generally speaking, from the perspective of how they eat and how they exercise. Not just a very short glimpse of the New Year's Eve celebrations in Times Square yesterday before talking out in the middle of the game. When during the game, UGA, Ohio State, they went to Times Square and showed everyone getting ready to bring in the new year, and everyone was wearing these funny hats. You see those funny hats? I mean, it seemed like the whole crowd was wearing this funny top hat. All said Planet Fitness on it. Thumbs up. Well, why is that? Well, because this time of year, guess what folks are willing to consider? They're willing to evaluate and contemplate the way they eat, the way they exercise, and are willing to consider whether or not changes should be made. Well, what about the Christian? What about having the self-control to press pause, not just once a year, but continually testing, evaluating, considering how it is we're living, the choices that we're making, and whether or not we should be making changes. You think about what Paul tells the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 13 and in verse 5, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? 
In other words, it is on you as to whether or not you are doing what it is you ought to be doing, and you need to have the control, the discipline, to actually evaluate whether or not you are in Jesus Christ or have become disqualified. Areas of self-control include inputs, emotions, and feelings, actions, evaluations. What about follow-up? In other words, as we evaluate, as we consider our life, as we contemplate our relationship with others and things that have taken place, how is it then that we re-engage? How is it then that we continue those relationships? Sometimes we do so in a bitter way. We do so based upon envy, based upon our dislike, or some type of rivalry that exists that's petty and irrelevant concerning spiritual things. Paul writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 4 to verse 31, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Put away that bitterness. Put away that envy. James will likewise write in James chapter 3 and verse 14, But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. Uh, let, let's consider how we're re-engaging and following up in our relationship with others. Is it being defined based upon bitterness? Or is it being defined in a different way and do we need to make a change because it is maybe based on bitterness and envy that we with control reset that relationship and that situation? Areas of self-control. But what about barriers of self-control? The ABCs of self-control. There are certain areas, but there's barriers that exist, are there not? What are some of the barriers as to why it is we fail to be self-controlled? Well, one is just flat-out selfishness. We're just straight-up selfish. Uh, we see what we see, and because we see it, uh, we just decide that uh, we'd like to engage in what we see before us. Uh, Paul says there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and in verse 32, he says, if in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Paul's saying if we're not living for eternity, if we're not living based upon the resurrection and that we get to be with God forever and ever in heaven, then what's the point of being controlled? What's the point of restraining ourselves regarding the physical things that are before us? Just live for yourself. Just live a hedonistic lifestyle, pursuing pleasure. Just eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. Who cares what it is we do? But of course, Paul's making a point. We will be resurrected. We will face eternal judgment. And so we ought not to live Selfishly, Paul will say, we don't walk by sight, but we walk by faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. We don't just, out of sight, out of mind, whatever it is that's before us, that's just what we do. Rather, we live by the word of God, that which we cannot see, those eternal things, that eternal abode that awaits us, that's what we are living for. A barrier of self-control is just selfishness. I see it before me, so I'm going to go after it. Why? Because I want to. What is another barrier of self-control? A lack of preparation. A lack of preparation. Uh, think about what we're commanded and what we really, from a theme perspective, have been looking, out, looking at throughout the year Thy word have I hidden mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119 and verse 11. We've been studying our life in him, our life in Jesus Christ. We're hiding the word of God in our heart so that we can live in Jesus. Well, if we're not taking the time to study the word of God, then we're going to lack the tools and the knowledge needful in order for us to be controlled by barrier self-control, selfishness, and lack of preparation. Also, just a lack of discipline. We may know the Word of God. We may 
uh, be aware of what God's Word says, but we may be choosing instead to not walk and live in them. We're lacking the discipline. Jesus says in John chapter 8 and verse 31, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples. Indeed, it's interesting that word disciple carries with it that idea of being one who is disciplined, one who is a student, one who is learning, but not just learning. Jesus is pointing out there in verse 31 of John 8, abiding in it requires discipline. Uh, what are some ways that we can evaluate, since this is New Year's Day, whether or not we are disciplined, or some areas that we can improve in being disciplined as it relates to being stewards of what we have before us? Well, I think you could really break that down to three categories. What is it that I'm doing with my time? Right? We all have the same number of hours per day to manage. How am I managing my time. Where am I putting the hours of my day? What am I doing with my time? But also you have this other piece, which is energy. Some of us have more energy than others, and so we can maybe get a little bit more done per hour than someone else. So I need to consider what is it that I'm doing with my time, but likewise, what is it that I'm doing with my energy? What it is that I'm capable regarding who I am as an individual or where I am in terms of the maturity curve of life. But also, what is it that I'm doing with my resources? What does the scorecard look like from a disciplined perspective regarding abiding and living in the Word of God as it relates to time, as it relates to energy, as it relates to resources? Where are my resources going? Where is my energy going? Where is my time going in terms of abiding in the Word of God. It's going to take self-control to do it right. Barriers of self-control, selfishness, lack of preparation, lack of discipline, and just our surroundings. Who it is we're choosing to surround ourselves with. You know, it's interesting, after verse 32, where Paul is making the case there that why is it that we would be living a restrained life if there's no such thing as a resurrection? Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. But there is a resurrection, and so therefore we are living restrained. We're living under the control of the will of God. And then he warns in verse 33 there, do not be deceived, evil company corrupts good habits. In other words, uh, your worldview your perspective regarding eternal things is going to be influenced based upon who it is that you surround yourself with. And so a barrier of self-control includes my surroundings. Who it is that I associate myself with. Who it is that I hold near to my life. The ABCs of self-control. Areas of self-control. Barriers of self-control. But what about circumstances of self-control? In other words those moments where we get ourselves into something where all of a sudden the rules kind of break down and it becomes a little cloudy and everything kind of becomes sideways a little bit. That's when self-control gets really hard. Take, for example, unforeseen events. Something happens in our lives that we didn't foresee happening. We didn't think would ever happen to us. It's maybe a trial of some kind, a difficulty of some kind. Or maybe even something that is beneficial to us from a secular perspective. Now all of a sudden, self-control gets a little harder. You think, for example, how Job's wife responded in the trials that Job would face in Job chapter 1 and chapter 2. In verse 9, his wife says to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. <laughs> Curse God and die. Why is it, Job, based upon the difficulties you've now had to endure, do you still aspire toward faithfulness to God? Throw in the towel. Give it up. I think sometimes we look for justification 
to be considered special. I think there are times that we are looking for an opportunity where the rules don't apply to us. Hey, because I'm facing what I'm facing, because I'm going through the challenge that I'm going through, certainly self-control should no longer apply given what it is I'm facing. In other words, I'm justified, I'm entitled to react and behave unruly and however I want. Well, it's interesting that we would think that, and certainly we are tempted to think that way at times. But you know, God calls us out on that very thought. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and in verse 13, Paul by inspiration writes, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. Isn't that interesting? God is basically saying here, you're not special. It doesn't matter what temptation, what difficulty you face. It doesn't matter what unforeseen event happens. Whatever it is you're facing, it's common to man. You don't get a pass to all of a sudden now not be faithful. God will make a way of escape so that you can bear that difficulty. Verse 13 at the end there. Circumstances of self-control where it's difficult. All of a sudden now we're questioning whether or not those rules apply. Whether or not I should stay on course. Just imagine once again that you're on that tightrope. And all of a sudden you're walking between two skyscrapers. Some kind of explosion takes place below. Some kind of thunderstorm takes place way out yonder. Does that mean all of a sudden you don't have to be looking at the tightrope anymore? Does that mean all of a sudden you get to get all caught up in whatever unforeseen event occurs? No, no, no. You're even more focused, are you not? I can't be distracted by these other things. I have to maintain course so I don't fall to my death. Circumstances where self-control becomes difficult, unforeseen events... What about defensiveness? All of a sudden, you're being attacked. You know, I'm a a proud American. I love our founding. I love our culture. I love the fact that we fought the British and won. But I think sometimes that mentality seeps into our spirituality a little too much. And we get the perspective that we're never to be wronged, and that if we are, we have every right to retaliate full force. We don't get that picture in the Scripture. 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter lays out for us what it is our Lord went through, and how it is we likewise are to respond when we might be tempted to become defensive and retaliate in a way that is ungodly. Peter states there, beginning of verse 18, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. Isn't that interesting? I mean, it's one thing if our boss is good and gentle, but if our boss is harsh, what do we think? Well, (laughs) why should I listen to you? Why should I do anything you say? You don't deserve it. You need to be taught a lesson. Peter's saying, no, no. You be submissive in both cases. Notice verse 19. For this is commendable if because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. It's one thing to be punished when you've done wrong and you take it patiently. But when you've done good, when you've done it right, and you still suffer? To take that patiently? To still be controlled in that situation? God says that is commendable. Verse 21, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return, when he suffered, did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. You are to pattern your life 
based upon the way in which the Savior endured suffering, into our endure it in the same way that He did. Circumstances where self-control is difficult, unforeseen events, defensiveness. What about excitement? Again, thinking about those unforeseen events where it's not a negative situation, but maybe something good has occurred in your life. Maybe you're benefiting from a secular perspective in some way. And you become excited. You become overjoyed because of those benefits. Self-control is hard in those circumstances. As a matter of fact, God gives us instruction as to how we are to respond in moments of bliss, in moments of of joy and and happiness, in, in moments of merriness. Just like we turn to God in moments of difficulty, we are likewise to turn to God in moments of excitement and joy. James chapter 5 and in verse 13, James says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. The next time that I may be challenged to be self-controlled because all of a sudden I'm excited because something's happened. Rather than becoming overly giddy and consumed with that excitement, to the point where I just forget God, I maintain control in that now I sing praises to God in that excitement. What kind of things are we talking about? Well, maybe I've come across a special someone. Maybe there's someone my father used to say, do you have any special friends? That was his way of saying, do you have a girlfriend? You know, sometimes you're young and all of a sudden there's for the younger men, a pretty little lady that comes about, or for the younger ladies, there's a, a man who comes about, and all of a sudden, excitement begins to be stirred up. Maybe all of a sudden, I've gotten a new job, and I'm excited. Maybe it's a new house. Maybe it's a new baby. Maybe familial circumstances are changing, and all of a sudden, that excitement just begins to brew. What can happen if you're not controlled? All of a sudden, you start thinking it's because of yourself. <laughs> Look at how great I am. Look at how wonderful I am. Look at all these wonderful things that are happening to me just because I'm so great. God says, if you're Mary, sing song. Next time something good happens in your life, why don't you press pause for just a second and say, let's sing praises to God for just a moment. an exciting situation. Paul will say to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 4, regarding the context there of he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him, verse 13, he stated in verse 12, he knows how to be abased and he knows how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. How is it, Paul, that regardless of your circumstances, up or down, good or bad, that you're doing what you're doing? Because in everything, he is seeking strength in Christ. Sometimes we think about self-control and we're so focused on the negative. But self-control includes how we respond and react to positive circumstances, to excitement. Brother or sister, are you here this morning and you're not living a controlled life? You're not piloting your soul based upon the commands of Jesus. You're not walking on that tightrope any longer. As a matter of fact, you're barely even hanging on by a finger. You need prayers of the congregation. You need encouragement. We're here to help you in any way.